Boeing stock price down 11.65% in seven days. Is it time to buy? Hi, and welcome to the Money Growth Academy. My name is Dee, and this is where we demystify the stock market, simplify investing, and multiply your opportunities for financial success. And today, yes, we're going to talk about Boeing. The stock is down. We're going to talk about it. But before we do that, I want to make sure that we send our condolences to the families uh, who have lost loved ones in the recent uh, plane crash there in, on the Ethiopian Airlines. And so uh, our, certainly our hearts and, our, and, our, and our, our prayers and our thoughts go out to those families. So what we're going to share with you in this video is we're going to share a little bit about Boeing's stock price as well as its financial performance. And then we're going to share with you what we call the DUMB process, D-U-M-M. We're going to share that with you. That's our method for processing, or I'm sorry, evaluating stocks. So you can determine whether or not Boeing right now, is it the right time to be buying Boeing? And then make sure you stay to the end because we're going to share with you what's going to be on part two. And that's going to be our decision making one on that one. So you want to make sure that you make it to the end of that. Hey, and if you haven't already done so, yes, hit the subscribe button below. So let's talk about what's been going on with Boeing the last seven days depending on where, where this gets released. Friends and family have been asking me about Boeing. Um, is, is it a good time to buy? Man, it look, looks like a very good event buy. Boeing's down 11.65%. Is it a good time? Boeing stock price is down from a, a high, well, just last Friday, right? March 8th, I believe it was. It was $422.54 a share, $422.54 a share. That was on March 8th. And it was as of today, March 14th, okay, Thursday, March 14th, it was $373.30. So that's 11.65% drop in stock price. That's a, that's a fairly sizable drop in price and certainly got my attention. Uh, and will it go lower? We don't know. Uh, so if you've been listening or, or you know, watching the news, uh, you know the story. So I'm not going to spend time and recap uh, the story there, but as it relates, uh, this video really is about uh, those economic impacts to Boeing and how that's going to affect them financially. And again, about is it a good time to buy Boeing? So several events have happened since the Ethiopian crash, and I'm just going to recap some of those. Uh, there is the FAA uh, investigation that has ensued. <clears throat> the European Union, the UK, Australia, Singapore, Indonesia, China, and other countries elected to ground the 737 MAX 8 uh, airplane. Canada announced on March 13th, early uh, that morning, that they were going to ground all Boeing 737 uh, MAX 8s. And then the U.S. finally, uh, later that day on March 13th, they decided to announce that they were going to ground all 737 MAX 8s as well. So the U.S. was the last to do that. Uh, another interesting factor is that the Norwegian Airlines uh, Norwegian Air, uh, they're demanding that Boeing compensate it for all the 737 MAX 8s that are grounded. So it is certainly going to be a financial impact. I also heard today that uh, all deliveries of 737 MAXs have been kind of halted. They're going to continue to build them, but they're going to halt these deliveries until the air clears, until they get this situation cleared up. So as a result of this, Again, the stock has dropped 11.65%. And the question is what to do with your Boeing stock. So if you own it, do I sell it? If I don't own it, do I buy it? Is a great time to buy it. Well, on the Money Growth Academy, we don't give stock advice, uh, but what we try to do is provide you some information so you can make a well-informed decision. And we're really all about information, education, and entertainment. That's really what we're about. And so the things, if, if you're trying to make a decision on these, you may want to, I would certainly suggest get back with your financial advisor, talk about these things, ask some questions of that. And because uh, we, we really don't know your financial situation. And because we don't know that, we can't provide you any advice. But we're certainly going to share some information with you. And what I'm about to share with you is our opinion. It's my opinion, okay? So take it for that. Uh, well, Look, if I own Boeing up to this point, and I don't, so I want to fully disclose that I currently, as of this uh, video, I do not 
own any Boeing stock. But if I owned it, I would most likely keep it, uh, right? Because I haven't seen any, as I go through the financial report, I'm going to go through some of this with you. I don't see anything structurally that's changed with management, uh, their strategy, their processes. And so structurally, the business looks the same. Now, I do have a little concern, right? Because we got to watch how this rolls out. What are the impacts to some of the decisions that have led to uh, the Ethiopian crash and the Indonesian one that took place five to six months ago. Well, Warren Buffett says price is what you pay, value is what you get. And I'm looking at the Boeing stock and I'm thinking, eh, it still looks a little rich to me, right? So let's talk about this. So we're going to take a look at some numbers. Uh, we're going to use a process. I'm going to at least introduce you to a process that, that uh, we like to use to evaluate a stock, to, to put it to some analysis to make sure that it, that it makes sense to us. And we're gonna walk through that with you. So what we're gonna look at is this dumb process. And so it's D-U-M-M, -M, process. And we like processes because it's like Edward Deming said, if you can't explain what you do in terms of a process, then you don't know what you're doing. So we like a process because it's replicatable, right? It's duplicatable. And so it, you can always do the same thing. So you're the consistency of how you're approaching things, right? So D is for durable competitive, competitive advantage. That means can the company protect its market advantage in the market? Can it protect itself? Warren Buffett talks about it in terms of a moat. So that's what we're talking about, a durable or sustainable competitive advantage that can be protected. That's, that's very key. And I'll cover more of that. We have another whole video that talks about, breaks down the, the dumb process. I'm not going to do that completely here because that's a little bigger process. And so that's D, durable competitive advantage. And then U is understand. Do I understand how the company makes money? Critical. You have to know how the company makes money. M, which I call M1, is management. Is there quality management in place? Meaning, is the management effective? And one of the ways that, uh, a few of the ways or measurements that we use to determine the effectiveness of management is we look at things such as ROE, which is return on equity, ROI, which is return on investment, uh, ROA, which is return on assets. And then we'll also look at, at debt. How well does the company manage the debt? Is the debt responsible debt that adds value to the company? And then finally, we'll look at CEO compensation because uh, compensation provides an incentive. Incentives drive behavior. And what we want those behaviors align to uh, shareholder benefits, right? That it's actually helping the company. And I've seen some really bad compensation plans out there that are more dialed in to the CEO and the executives than to the shareholders. And so we want to make sure that's not taking place. And then the final piece is margin of safety. And margin of safety is really about, can I buy this stock at a discount? So I've got to try to determine to the best I can estimate what the intrinsic value of the stock is because then I could base my discount from there up or down, right? So I'm, I'm going from there. So that margin of safety, very critical to determine if I really got a discount, if I'm really sitting on a discount here to make this purchase. So I'm gonna run Boeing through this very quickly. So durable competitive advantage, does Boeing have a durable competitive advantage? I think they do, and this is why. Let me share a few things with, with you. Look, there's really only two large airline companies, right, that manufactures, that, that manufacture large full-size air, airliners, and that is Boeing and Airbus. And Boeing is huge. It, it's just so much bigger in so many classes and so many categories. When you're looking down a, a financial statement, they're just bigger. And so they have a, a, an economy of scale, so to speak, which gives them a lot of leverage in the marketplace as well. And out there right now, there are no full-size airliner programs anywhere on the planet that offer enough technological advances that would make another airline like United or, or any of these airlines change and want to go 
to this new airline, right? Because there's, there's just too much at stake. So in terms of parts, in terms of reliability, in terms of liability, right? So if a plane does go down, uh, it's going to take some deep pockets. And so it's, this is the, the barrier to entry into these full-size carrier markets is, is really high, very high barrier to entry. So as a matter of fact, Airbus just bought uh, Canada, which was, I think it was like third or fourth largest of the large airliners, a airliners and Airbus just bought them. So that was D, durable competitive advantage. Does Boeing have that? Yes. U, let's talk about the U, understanding. Do, do I understand how they make money? All right, so let's see if we can understand how Boeing makes, makes money, where its revenue comes from. So as we can look on this chart here, this pie chart, what I call Boeing's playground, we can see that the commercial airline business is their biggest chunk of their revenue, 60.2%. So the commercial airlines, just to give you some numbers, uh, it represents 60 billion, 715 million in revenue for 2018 with an operating margin of 13%. And that's up uh, that's up three points from the prior year. And if we can look at uh, defense and space and aerospace, that is 23% of their total revenue. And that represents about 23 billion, 195 million in revenue for 2018. And that's up 13% over the prior year. It did experience a negative 3.8% drop in operating margin in the defense, space, and security uh, segment of their business. And that operating margin was about 6.9%. Uh, there's The margins are a little bit thinner here because there's a lot more competition that they experience and defense, safety, and, and defense, space, and security. So uh, you kind of have to keep that in perspective, even though it did decrease uh, ever so slightly. So the other segment is global services, which includes performance-based logistic contracts, uh, crew management solutions that they have called analytics powered services. Uh, they just purchased KLX. They deal with you know, airplane hardware and parts and so forth. It's like over a, over a million numbered parts and over 3,000 suppliers worldwide. And uh, they had revenues of about 17 billion, 18 million in 2018, uh, operating, mar operating margins of 14, 8 0.8%. So there's quite a bit of margin there, uh, even though that was down by uh, six tenths of a percent from the prior year. So all the information that I just shared with you, that's either on the annual statement is where I'm getting that from, or the proxy statement, right? So I'm getting it from either one of those two places. So now we've done durable competitive advantage. We did, do we understand where the money comes from? And we just walked you through that. And now we're going to talk about the first M, which I call M1, which is management. And I, I gave you a little briefing about the fact that some of the pieces that we look at, and that is return on equity, return on investment, and return on assets. So let's dig into these a little bit. So I'm going to pull these, this, uh, uh, these tables up so you can take a look at this. And I have a Fidelity account. And because I've, I use Fidelity because of the, the type of rich reports that I need, I can get them at a glance. They're all in one spot. I don't have to go a whole lot of places to get a lot of this information. It's right there at my fingertips. And so uh, I'm a Fidelity. That's where I do most of my trading, trading in. So ROE, uh, and, and an ROE is really about how effective it is at conver converting the money and invest to net income. That's what ROE is. And a target, good target range is about 20%. And then, as you can see here, that return on equity for Boeing was, well, it's negative 3,579%. Now, there's some reasoning behind that and the way that the, these uh, airline and aerospace companies work and the, the sizable assets and uh, things like that. So that one doesn't scare me that much because it can have another big swing the other way. And if you look at their historical return on equity, you'll see that. So that one doesn't really scare me at all. And then we take a look at 
because uh, you can see right there in the fourth quarter, it was over 4,000%. So big swings. So that one doesn't scare me if you understand the business. And so return on investment, uh, it's a performance measure used to evaluate the efficiency uh, of an investment. How are they, how effective is the company, is the management team and the investments that they get, how do they put them to work, right? To drive revenue. And you can see here, return on investment. TTM is uh, trailing 12 months and that is 74.5%. You'll also notice that to the very right column of that, it shows you a comparison to the industry. And so you can see that they lead the industry in that particular, that particular measurement. And then return on assets, it measures how efficiently the company is at using all stakeholder assets to earn a return. So how do they, all these assets that they have, how are they using them to generate a better return on money that's been invested in them? So that's what we're looking at there. And the target range for there, I like 15 to 20% or better when I, when I can find that. And return on assets is 9.12, a little higher than the industry uh, average. Not bad. Now, when you're looking at these, these numbers, yeah, I say like 15 to 20%, but you also have to look at the nature of the business too, right? And where those margins are, you have to look at how the, you know, depreciate, you have to look at all these pieces to see if that makes sense in that given industry. And compared to the industry, it actually does quite well. So let's talk about the next piece. So we talked about ROE, ROI, ROA. These are all things that we use. We look in the financial statement. Uh, we look at the annual report. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find, we're looking for these things because they tell us how effective the management is with the resources that it's given to grow the business. And so now let's look at another component that I have within that measure of management, and that is debt. And what I'm looking for there is, can the company, can the managers effectively manage the debt? And are they using the debt properly, right? Because you could irresponsibly use the debt just to drive up, uh, just to pay for some things and drive up some things to make it look like the company's doing well. Like for instance, you could borrow money to pay for dividends. So I'm looking for how they're using that debt. And the other things that I'm looking for here is total current assets. Like for instance, Boeing has total current assets of 87 billion, 830 million. And then they have a total current liabilities of 81 billion, 590 million. So it gives me a sense that Boeing has uh, access to the short term, you know, they have access to cash, right? Because that's what I like about current assets. Those are those things that can be turned to cash very quickly or, or cash equivalents. And so it tells me they could service their short, short term debt and even some of their long term debt. All right. So I'm throwing a lot at you at the same time. So I'm, I'm throwing a lot at you. I'm throwing some numbers at you, but I want you to get a sense of where this dumb process, how it works, how it helps us figure out structurally is the company right right it doesn't make is and hopefully this is making sense to you so the final piece of trying to measure management effectiveness is i'm looking at executive compensation and and ceo compensation and as i told you before some of the reasons i'm looking for that is because compensation drives behavior right incentives drive behavior so how they get paid is how they're going to function and what they're going to focus on. And so we want to make sure that compensation is aligned with, sh with the goals of the company for growing the company, right? For providing more value to the shareholders. So I typically, you'll find uh, compensation oftentimes in your proxy reports. And so that's where you'll typically find that. And so I'm just going to walk through some of the things I found in Boeing's proxy report. So under the category of pay for performance, because I'm trying to get some relative comfort, right? A relative comfort about how well are they paying these guys well and are they paying them the right way so it works to us, the shareholders' benefits. And so pay for performance, it says our executive compensation program is designed to reward strong performance, attract and retain superior leaders, and align our executive interests 
with long-term interests of our shareholders. And that's what we're always looking for. And a lot of companies say this stuff, but then when you dig in deeper, the compensation packages don't align to what they say their goals are, okay? So, but this is what I found with Boeing that gives me some comfort. It says approximately 90% of our CEO's uh, target compensation was variable and at risk. That means it was not guaranteed. They, they've got to hit some targets to make sure that those, that they get that, uh, they get access to that cash that it's available, those incentives. So 90, 90% uh, tied to uh, some targets and it's variable in nature. And then secondly, there's no incentive payouts for performance below threshold. So they have certain thresholds they have to hit. And if they're underneath those, the company doesn't have to pay out those, uh, don't have to pay out those additional in incentives. So let's talk about alignment with shareholder interest. It says 25% of Boeing's named executive officers, their target long-term incentive compensation is tied to Boeing's shareholder return relative to a pre-established group of peer companies. So that's important to know. So they, they 25%, right? 25, that's a, that's a nice chunk of their money that's tied to, that, that is tied to some pre-established group of peer companies that they have. Now, they don't necessarily name those, but they've got to, they've got to hit those targets and they have to meet those comparisons, beat those comparisons, right? So to, to actually cash in on those bonuses, I like that. It says here, forfeiture of unearned incentive program awards upon termination or retirement. So that means whether they, if they terminate or they retire, you know, midway through, then they forfeit all of the unearned bonuses and incentives. So that's, that's fantastic. You're there to start, you're there to finish, right? And so the next piece is rigorous stock holding period. So that means it, they have to hold that stock for a specified uh, length of time. Uh, and so they have some ownership requirements, including six times base salary for our CEO, ensuring that executive officers maintain a significant stake in our long-term success. So they have to own some shares and they're obligated to hold those shares for a considerable amount of time, which locks, the, which locks them in, right? It absolutely locks them in uh, to the success of the company. So we've gone through durable competitive advantage. We've talked about understanding how they make money. We've talked about management, and how effective it is, and some of the measures that we use to get there. And now we're gonna talk about M2, right? It's the second M and that's margin of safety. And that is, it's really talking about, can I buy the stock at a discount? And for me to establish whether or not I can buy it at a discount, I have to help, I have to determine the intrinsic value of the stock. And that's what I'm trying to do. It, Cause I can't determine if I'm getting, if, if I'm buying it at a discount, if I don't know what the real worth of the stock is. And so what I'm gonna try to do is do some estimates that get me there. And there's a number of ways to, to, determine the, mar the margin of safety. And there's some websites that you can go that you can use these things for. I like a more simpler calculation and I'm actually, actually not gonna go into that in this particular video. Uh, I'm actually gonna do a separate video that talks about calculating margin of safety. And uh, because again, if you can buy it at a discount, then you can lower your risk because you're in it very, you, you're in the stock good. And I like what Monash Probri says, he's a, 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 a top-notch investor in a Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger style of investing. And in the way he thinks about stocks is heads I win, tails I lose a little. And, and that's really when you're buying it right and you're buying it at a discount, you do well. It's, it's extremely hard in this market uh, that we're dealing with here, um, you know, post 2008 to get a stock at its intrinsic value is not impossible. It's just a lot more, a lot more difficult. I'm not going to walk you through those calculations, but uh, we have another video to kind of walk you through. It'll be one entire video on just margin of safety because you want to make sure that you, that you understand that. Now that we have a little better view of Boeing 
and kind of what, what's the makeup of the company? Is it healthy? Those types of things. Now we're going to dial in. Okay. So the next video I want to discuss uh, with you, wait, well, before we get there, make sure you subscribe, hit the thumbs up, give us a like if you like the video and certainly hit notification so you can be ready to get part two of this series, which is about, well, what's the decision, right? So we're going to answer the question. And what was the question? Should I buy, right? Should I buy Boeing? Is it a good time to buy Boeing? And so what we're going to talk about in decision time, which is part two, is what is it that I like about Boeing? So as a result of going through this dumb process, what do I like about Boeing? And then secondly, what disturbs me about Boeing? There's some things in there that disturb me as I go through there. What would be my personal decision? So I'll share that with you as well. And we'll catch you next time.